afternoon. I'm Arthur Herman, Senior Fellow at the Hudson Institute and Director of Hudson's Quantum Alliance Initiative, which is the international uh, consortium and think tank organization that we founded in 2018 uh, to encourage international cooperation in the key developments in what will be the rising technology of the 21st century, namely quantum information science and quantum technology. Um, we have a membership now of more than 20 uh, companies and labs and universities from 10 countries. And uh, while our focus has been from the beginning of our founding in 2018 on all aspects of quantum uh, technology, from quantum computing and quantum sensing uh, to quantum optics and quantum cryptography, uh, one of our most important focuses has been on the national security implications of quantum technology uh, and its applications in the realm of national as security as well as economic security. And it's in that particular area, uh, particularly the role that future quantum technology developments will play in challenging uh, and intruding into the uh, public encryption systems on which so much of our world currently depends, that we have released this, our third report on the possible and potential quantum computer threat posed to key aspects of America's critical infrastructure and by implication then the uh, infrastructure um, and uh, its implication, infrastructure around the world and its implications for uh, uh, the future of this century. Um, this third report, um, Prosperity at Risk, the Quantum Computer Threat to the U.S. Financial System, is, as I say, the third of the reports that we've done in series here dealing with the question of what would happen if a future quantum computer were able to engage in large-scale decryption uh, of those systems, particularly in financial systems, upon which we want to have as secure uh, and as protected as possible by modern technologies. And it's within the spirit of that discussion of what the implications of this report and the research that we've done uh, that we've put together this panel for today. Uh, and with, I will be talking about the report and the substance and content of that report um, with the Associate Director of the Quantum Alliance Initiative and my colleague uh, Alex Butler, who is here, here on my right. And also we've invited two distinguished panelists uh, to discuss the implications of the report um, for both the uh, nation's and international financial system, but also uh, of what its implications are for a future development of quantum technology, and in particular for the uh, quantum cryptography and post-quantum cryptography to protect against such a future quantum attack. And those two colleagues are on my left, uh, John Prisco, CEO of Safe Quantum Inc., and uh, longtime friend and colleague, uh, Alex Pollack uh, of the Mises Institute. And I'll be introducing our panelists um, uh, prior to their remarks in this discussion. But first, I want to talk about the genesis of this report and how it came about um, as part of what we've been doing here at Hudson Institute on quantum technology since, since 2018. Actually, even before that, um, when... 2017, we hosted here at Hudson Institute the very first conference, international conference, on quantum technology um, in Washington, D.C., and the various aspects and consequences of both the risks but also opportunities that quantum technology brings to bear. But Alex, this report, this particular report on the uh, implications of a possible quantum computer threat to the Federal Reserve and specifically the Fed wire system, the means by which interbank 
large-scale interbank settlements are, are cleared uh, and distributed within the U.S. financial <laughs> system. This has been a long time in, in coming, isn't it? Indeed. Um, we originally came up with the idea of this project, what, three years ago? Uh, three and a half. Three and a half years yeah. ago, um, shortly after you came on board, as a matter of fact, um, working with me, uh, that the idea was is that uh, here you have this uh, a possible threat because of the nature of quantum computers and the way in which large-scale quantum computers would be able to factorize the prime numbers that underlie public encryption systems, um, that this was a threat that needed to be understood not just simply as a theoretical challenge to public encryption systems and cybersecurity as a whole, uh, but also one that needed to be quantified. That while there were many uh, uh, who had warned about the challenges uh, that such a future quantum computer threat might pose from a national security point of view or from a cybersecurity point of view, that no one had really sat down and worked out what the numbers might look like for the different scenarios involved with this kind of attack. So we decided we were going to do that. Absolutely. Um, and came up with the project that was, in fact, really focused on the financial uh, system as a whole and then began to look around for people who would be interested in helping to sponsor and do the research that would back up this kind of support, this kind of project. Um, we had n several discussions with people in the Treasury Department um, about this study and what its implications were. Um, we did some preliminary run of the numbers to generate some results, which were pretty harrowing, <laughs> as I recall. Right uh, in the neighborhood of what one to two trillion dollars, we were thinking if you had a full-scale cascading effect uh, on the financial system, if a quantum computer could in fact decrypt those kind of protective systems. Is and we right? and those numbers were very daunting at the time. Very daunting um, at the time, um, but they were still rough. It was rough calculations. Yes. What we really wanted to do was to plunge in and do a really systematic study. Uh, something that would really be uh, an exemplary study that could be used in order to understand both the nature of the threat, but also, and this was always uppermost in our minds, to understand the solutions to the threat and how effective and how efficient those would be and cost efficient they would be relative to the costs involved in having our financial system and other infrastructure vulnerable to an attack of this kind. So we had conversations with uh, officials in the Treasury. I even had a conversation with uh, people in the Homeland, Department of Homeland Security at CISA, right, the agency that oversees, uh, inter, uh, oversees uh, cybersecurity uh, and information security at the same time. And I would say, by and large, the response was lukewarm. Um, and uh, it was, we began to feel after a year or so of, of peddling this idea of this project, we began to sort of feel like um, uh, Paul Revere riding through the streets of Boston shouting, the, quant the quantum troops are coming, the quantum troops are coming, and every house you go by, they close the window. <laughs> um, and now, by the, way, this, by the way, this is not to say that the officials that we spoke to, including Fed, Federal Reserve officials, were being uh, complacent or naive uh, in or, or um, uh, negligent in any kind of way. There were many reasons why uh, I think the response tended to be, tended to be lukewarm and, and provisional. Uh, one of them was that, it, that they were just getting their minds around what the threat was in a conceptual level, let alone wanting to look into or in some gay, uh, support or sponsor uh, a deep technical dive into the problems and issues that would be involved with. The second, I think, uh, obstacle, or should we say, one of the things that also was on, uppermost on people's minds was, at the same time at which we were talking about this threat, the National Institute of Standards and Technology was in the process of generating its standards for post-quantum cryptography algorithms. In other words, for the set of hardware algorithms, software algorithms that would allow 
uh, protection against future quantum computer attack, at least in a theoretical sense. Um, and federal agencies, I found, were reluctant, were reluctant by and large, uh, to address this issue head on until the National Institute or the NIST, though it by its, uh, its acronym, had come up with its set of standards of what those um, post quantum cryptography standards would look like. Didn't want to get too far ahead, too far ahead of the game uh, in that regard. And then there was a third reason, and that was the one that I think uh, ultimately was, was the one that which we could not give any kind of direct answer. And they said, well, oh, I'm sorry, the third, the third one I should mention is the idea that the quantum computer threat seemed so far out in the horizon, so far out in the horizon, uh, that having to tear away from the more <laughs> urgent issues that were fe the federal government and federal agencies like the Treasury were facing at the time, such as COVID, uh, seemed a less urgent than having to deal with or come to grips with what a future quantum computer attack might look like, even on the very heart and most vulnerable parts of our financial system and infrastructure. Those, all those factors, and given the fact that it was each time we would ask, so what do the numbers look like? How big a threat are we talking about uh, in terms of catastrophic losses in the financial and banking system as opposed to the costs of uh, developing and in installing uh, quantum safe solutions, whether software or hardware? And our panelist, John Prisco, is going to talk about the distinction between those two, those two aspects of quantum protections uh, when, when, we, when we turn to, turn to our panel. With all of those things in mind, um, it was difficult for us to sort of get the kind of traction that we were hoping to, to do under those circumstances. Then two things happened. The first was we struck up a partnership with Oxford Economics, which is a global econometrics research firm which was able to provide through their services the kind of quantitative data that may would make it possible for us to work on a really rigorous study of what the large scale effects of a catastrophic failure of a system, whether you're talking about the Federal Reserve or whether you're talking about the nation's power grid or energy grid, um, would allow us to gather the data and to do the kind of close analysis that we wanted to do, but that we also felt would make the issue of a quantum threat more real and, uh, and more palpable, especially to those whose lives are spent analyzing numbers and sifting through data, particularly financial data. That was number one. The second was that, um, that those in the private sector who understood they, both the nature of the future quantum threat, but also at the same time the, uh, the, the, the fact that the solutions, the protections against the threat, such a threat were already here. They were already at hand and could be mobilized and used uh, in ways that would make the process of getting quantum ready and quantum secure much easier and much more efficient than it would have been uh, in most people's minds two or three years earlier, um, that the private sector also became in interested in generating a report which they could use in order to say, look, here's what the numbers look like. Here's what losses could be if you're not protected against this kind of future quantum computer threat uh, versus what investment now would cost in order to defend against that kind of catastrophic, even apocalyptic threat in the future. Then the White House stepped in. And that was, and not, I think, entirely coincidental with the work that we had been doing, pushing on this threat for, through my columns in Forbes and in the Wall Street Journal. The, Wall, the, the White House became interested also in the palpable nature of a quantum computer threat to key federal agencies and to sensitive uh, data and networks within the federal government. And beginning in January, this past January, to, to 
January 2022, it began to issue a series of, of executive orders um, uh, requiring federal agencies to begin charting a timeline uh, to when they would be ready uh, to protect their data and networks, particularly sensitive data uh, and data and networks from future quantum computer intrusion. And that, I think, forced everyone now to take seriously the threat that we've been warning about as here at Paul Revere Central in the quantum technology sector, to take seriously what this threat could mean uh, and that a timeline was going to be necessary in order to protect those data networks within key federal agencies as a whole. Because as we had been pointing out from the very beginning, um, that while the timeline to a large-scale quantum computer threat did stretch out for a number of years, perhaps even a decade or more, the process of migrating key systems over to a quantum secure and quantum safe data and networks of sifting through legacy systems of cybersecurity protections, some of them going back decades without major changes or upgrades, of figuring out where your most vulnerable areas were, figuring out how you're going to take out and replace or upgrade those systems in order to achieve this kind of quantum security was itself going to be a long road that could take a decade or more and that needed to be needed to get started as soon as possible to be ready for a threat which may be out there for a decade or more or as we've seen with other kinds of technologies sudden breakthroughs coming that bring that threat much quicker and much faster than even the experts had predicted with all of those things in mind then we decided that we were going to take on this question of providing a quantitative measure of the future quantum computer threat, not by trying to deal with the situation, or the, the threat as a whole, but by breaking it down into digestible slices. And so we did with a series of reports in partnership with quantum, with, with Oxford Economics. The very first one we did was on the the potential of a future quantum computer attack on the po nation's power grid and energy grid. When did that come out? Do you remember, Alex? Oh, uh, 2021. 2021 uh, was the first of these reports that we did using econometric methodologies in order to arrive at a quantitative uh, analysis of what would happen. Then the second one that we did, uh, which was on the, the threat and the costs involved in a future quantum computer attack on the cryptocurrency markets and the way in which uh, we were able to demonstrate how much of the current financial markets had come to depend upon the safety and security of, quant of, of cryptocurrencies uh, and that the reliance on blockchain and distributed ledger, ledger technology uh, while providing an important layer of security to ha conventional hacking uh, was also still vulnerable to future quantum computer attacks at the same time. And that report, which we did, checking oh, last with you again, year. that was last year. And now we come to the third of our reports, which is, I think, the culmination and the most complex of the ones that we have done, but which I believe is the most, in the end, the most valuable, the most far-reaching. Namely, an overall study of the impact of a potential quantum computer attack on the Federal Reserve, and in particular on the Fedwire system, uh, which is one of the main bulwarks that supports the interbank transaction um, network on which our nation's financial system depends, but which also by implication on which the world financial system also depends, where a sustained quantum computer attack on that system would have global implications as well as sweeping implications for uh, what we what what our our financial system and economy would have to would have to endure for a protracted length of time because of the nature of a quantum computer attack and that's my last point here before we talk about the report itself that what we what we had described from the very beginning about the the essential nature of potential quantum computer attacks is is the difference 
the contrast between what we think of as conventional computer hacking or conventional computer attacks. Because by the very nature of the decryption process that quantum computers bring, that this brings the ability to the hacker, the malicious user, to uh, present all of their actions and transactions as being thoroughly authentic and thoroughly checked out and validated within, within the system. That, for example, in breaking into blockchain, that far from just being simply a hack into an intrusion into the system, that the hacker appears like just another member of the distributed ledger uh, and carrying out transactions just like everybody else within the blockchain. So it is on the one hand, it's, a, it's an attack which is thoroughly stealthy and undetectable, in, certainly from contrast with conventional attack. The second feature of it being that it is also an attack which, because of its massed quality, can be protracted and can, can carry on its malicious uses on for days, weeks, even months without fear of detection while creating havoc and to whether it's talking about, whether we're talking about the power grid or cryptocurrencies markets or in the case, the Federal Reserve. So that's the background to what the report and to what we've done and what we've undertaken. Um, and I'm going to ask Alex to talk a little bit about what the conclusions that we reached as a result of our deep dive into this area. Alex has been the person who's been leading our research team on this work. Um, he has been the one who has done the bulk of the, uh, of, of the hard uh, number crunching that underlies this report and the conclusions that are reached. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Alex to talk about what we found and, and what this study really has been able to unearth about what that quantum computer attack looked like. And I'll just preface this by saying one of the things that did come out of this report is that our initial estimates that we drew up a year or two ago when we first got embarked with this turned out to understate the problem, didn't it? Absolutely. So when we first began this journey prior to the Oxford Economics <coughs> Partnership, um, it, was a, it was what we called the quick and dirty estimation. And that was by no means not scientific or mathematical, but it was, it was an understatement. Um, but unfortunately, even though the Oxford Economic System is, is quite a powerful modeling tool, there's no button that says quantum computer attack. Yeah. Um, so there's quite a bit of uh, background methodology that went into this uh, and examining the relationships that are that make up the uh, financial system in the United States. Um, unfortunately, another added element that um, built into this report or, or launched it forward uh, was that this is a, a, on the conventional cyber attack front, this is still a, um, a novel field in estimating these problems. So there wasn't a lot of literature to go off of. So this was quite uh, uncharted territory, you might say. Yep. Um, and even the experiences that we have seen, like NotPetya in 2018, or sorry, 2017, and other uh, events such as the uh, the pipeline shutdown, um, or even the major COVID, conventional hacks, in other words. Absolutely. Even those, putting a number to it is quite challenging. So we had to dive into the network and the financial system in the United States and see how it really operated. One of the challenges um, about protecting or even analyzing the financial network in the United States, or for that fact, uh, most of the infrastructure in the United States or, or national security uh, critical infrastructures, are that there is a cyber and a physical domain. And that's very true with the financial sector and the, the uh, networks there because it spills over into uh, connected industries, networks, and so on. Um, That's so that ripple effect. Absolutely. Problem. So we really did a lot of work examining this contagion factor and examining not only how the federal, uh, the federal, sorry, Federal Reserve's Fedwire system impacts the economy, uh, but also how that then moves throughout the entire network and the country and the, uh, the international financial system as a whole. So we began by looking at and quantifying for the first time the degree to which uh, Fedwire transaction values, uh, the growth in that, 
impacts gross, med uh, gross domestic product in the United States. And we found that there is quite a strong relationship, what's called Granger causality, uh, which is as close as you can get really in, in uh, econometrics to uh, true theoretical causality. And just to understand, Fed Fedwire system is devised in order to move large sums of money, correct? Absolutely, and that's a, that's a network property that made this that makes the network uh, and the system so exposed. There's a lot of concentration in this network between the largest banks, and that's a trend that has increased and is only set to increase yeah. as regional banks become consolidated, and that actually propagates the problem. So, if you look at one major bank, which a, a New York uh, Federal Reserve uh, study in 2021. Uh, examined, uh, if one major or large network bank is taken off of uh, Fedwire, 40% of the banking system can, can go um, and when you're talking about sol large, insolvent. We're talking, we're talking about assets of what, about $50 billion? Uh, yes, if not more. If not more. And, uh, and so that's just one large bank. But the problem with that study, which is otherwise a, a fantastic work, um, is there's not numbers. So that's where we came in. To, to apply it to the quantum front, as well as quantifying the issue at hand. And um, as we worked to transcribe or, or the qualitative features of the financial network and the quantum case to this Oxford economics model, we ultimately found that uh, even in a cyber case, a conventional cyber case with um, Watson, or if not just a laptop, a one-day attack would lead to losses in GDP of something like $2 trillion. And that's from one-day interruption of this real-time growth One-day interruption. Yes, one-day interruption. And that looks like a negative 10% or a 10% loss in annual GDP in one day. Um, and that's from projected... Uh, or, or standardized uh, projections of GDP growth. But in the quantum case, it gets even worse. Um, the maximum impact, so uh, uh, in our study that we described the scenario as, where an uh, intruder is able to not only research and, in, um, and interject themselves into the network prior to the, uh, the launch of the attack's spy and um, find the most vulnerable point of entry and the most valuable target. Uh, and that sort of scenario, we're looking at $3.3 trillion in lost gro gross domestic product in the United States alone. And these are just your indirect costs. So this is if, a if that banking system is unable to settle at the end of the day, how it trickles down throughout the, the economy through things like liquidity crunches, uh, bank insolvency, uh, stock markets, and, and um, otherwise confidence throughout the, the United States economy and the ultimately the financial system at large. At large. Uh, we got a, we, there's even a section, Section 8, on the economic impacts of a quantum computer cyber attack on the Fed wire interbank payment system, <clears throat> looking at the eco economic effects with it too. I mean, the report is it's 60 pages long. Uh, it's daunting for the, uh, should we say, the, the non-expert to do it, um, I posted a uh, Forbes column uh, for, uh, as part of my usual Forbes column on technology issues, um, talking about the report and kind of summarizing things for the, for the lay audience uh, of what goes into it. But one of the things that we've did in that report, or I should say you did, and, and, uh, and, and our research <laughs> team, including, including Mike Torino, who is here with us, our intern, uh, but also Daley Pagano, who was involved with it here as well, uh, was to run a and, series of scenarios. And Drew Plummer as well. And Drew Plummer. I should also mention Drew as well, who was part of that. Uh, also part of, our, uh, part of our intern team working on it, was to do a series of scenarios, right? From worst case to a baseline case scenario at the same time here as well. Um, so it's a, it's a report which is packed with graphs, packed with footnotes, back with, uh, uh, for months of research and work on it. But I think the conclusions um, are, are ones that are serious enough and uh, are far-reaching enough that I think it'll be a, I think, it's a, I think it's a landmark work, not just for QAI, but also I think in terms of the research on what, uh, on what 
the threat of future quantum computer decryption could look like and what its, uh, what its capacity is. And it's in order to understand that, the implications of that, that I asked two uh, distinguished colleagues and friends to join the panel um, and to discuss what the implications or consequences are for this on the one hand with regard to the financial sector and then on the other hand with where we are in terms of <coughs> quantum cybersecurity uh, and the types of technologies and solutions available to deal with and to mitigate the risks that are involved with it. So now it's time to introduce our two panelists who've been waiting patiently for a chance to have their say in what's taking place here. The first panelist I want to call upon is my good friend, Alex Pollack. Alex is a senior fellow at the Mises Institute, or is it Mises? Mises. Mises Institute. And uh, sometimes I anglicize that name. If you take out the fun Mises, I yes. always say fun Mises fun. and the Mises. <laughs> and is the co-author of Surprised Again, the COVID crisis and the new market bubble. Previously, he served as deputy, principal deputy director of the Office of Financial Research at the US Treasury Department. That was from 2019 to 2021. Uh, distinguished senior fellow at the R Street Institute down the street here from 2015, 2019, and again in 2021. Resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute from 2004, 2015. That's how we met and became uh, friends and colleagues. And president and CEO of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago from 1991 to 2004. Uh, you're going to be hard pressed to find anyone who has had as much um, experience and knowledge, and I would sort of say uh, uh, seasoning in the uh, vicissitudes of financial systems, <laughs> financial markets, having watched them with a keen philosophic eye uh, of the foibles and directions of the financial system, which is one of the reasons why when I became engaged in this research work, I turned to Alex, both for advice and counsel, but also because I thought that a lot of the fruits of our research would be of great interest to him uh, and would be something that would be uh, add to both his knowledge of quantum technology and uh, its future implications, but also for understanding some of the uh, uh, other vulnerabilities of today's mar financial markets and systems beyond the ordinary machinations of human ignorance and weakness. Alex? Thank you, Arthur. Well, human ignorance and weakness always plays, of course, <laughs> uh, in anything that's going on. Thanks a lot for inviting sure. me and having me. Thanks to Alex and Arthur uh, for this highly interesting and provocative and instructive uh, paper on the risk to the financial system from the development of quantum computing. I am here on behalf of the threatened financial system uh, not because I know much, if anything, about quantum mechanics or quantum computing. So a anybody else in the audience who's here principally on the financial side as opposed to the quantum side? <coughs> we need to fix that for the future. <laughs> right. Uh, well, if we Well, you're an army of one in this case, Alex. <laughs> so take, take, a, take, take so that So here I seems. am for the viewpoint of the threatened, as we say, financial system, a system thoroughly computerized and completely independent and completely dependent, completely dependent on the trustworthy functioning of massive uh, settlement systems which, which uh, process every day unimaginable amounts of transactions in all kinds of different assets, stocks, bonds, derivatives, whatnot. Um, you can think uh, in one sense, a financial system as an amazingly large and complex dance of something simple, namely debits and credits, dancing, now all electronic, uh, now thoroughly dependent on the electronic settlement, electronic record keeping. It's no more Bob Cratchit writing the debits and credits with his quill pen. And there's, uh, if the electronic system isn't working, there's, there's nothing there. So a dance of debits and credits, all electrically held in unimaginable volumes. 
And the ratio of the debits and credits to the cash accounts compared to the uh, debits and credits to various asset accounts is the price. And the prices, of course, uh, are moving and determining solvency and insolvency. Uh, could a new quantum computer, if it was really working, mess all this up? That's, uh, it, it seems clear that it could, and that the cost of being so messed up would be uh, immense. Uh, Alex and Arthur write, the financial sector network presents a prime target uh, for a quantum attack. That seems right to me. If you were having a dispute with the United States in other ways and you wanted to make it more complicated, why not take down the financial system as a distraction, uh, let's say in the midst of a, an invasion of Taiwan or something, uh, interesting thing. Uh, even the Financial Times uh, is caught up. The Financial Times wrote the other day, the financial industry is on the front line of escalating digital war. Financial services is one of the sectors most impacted by quantum computing, uh, said the Financial Times. And the Wall Street Journal told me this morning that chief information security officers in corporations faced with all their challenges are experiencing burnout, that 73% of these information security officer, officers in the U.S. said they'd experienced burnout, 73%. Well, just imagine how burned out they're going to be when they're <laughs> faced with quantum computers. Um, uh, Arthur and Alex write, uh, imagine the impact, I say imagine, but they say the impact of a cascading quantum attack on major banks, the Federal Reserve, stock exchanges, and derivatives exchanges, including the Fedwire, and as Arthur rightly said, the, uh, the Federal Reserve is the central bank not only of the United States, but of the dollar-denominated world. So we're talking about the world here. Uh, and uh, they say that this represents the potential for a sy systemically disruptive event, and that, uh, that seems right to me that it, that it does, as distinct from classic hacking, which is something about, well, your, your operations, Mr. Bank or whoever you are, are closed down, your customers are inconvenienced, your customers are robbed. That's different from a systemically disruptive event, and that's really, I think, where this conversation from this report is is taking us. Well, I, um, I wrote a book a few years ago called "Why We're uh, Called a Finance and Philosophy: Why We're Always Surprised by Financial Markets and the Strange Nature of Financial Markets with Their inter Interaction of Human Behavior and Financial Magnitudes." Why we're always surprised, and then a couple years later, uh, uh, we were surprised again <laughs> by the financial panic and of 2020. So then we followed up with a book called Surprised Again, Why We're Always Surprised, Surprised Again. Uh, now the, in, in, in two, 2020, uh, the emergence of a, uh, of a new strain of virus, apparently out of this lab in China, the, the emergence of new strains of virus were Certainly probable, maybe certain in time, well known to science. But the emergence of that new strain of virus turned into a financial panic, uh, a temporary but very deep economic contraction, and an ongoing financial crisis in which we are still living three years later, really all coming out of the panic uh, of 2020. Well, that's our, our book, Surprised Again. but. What kind of surprises uh, may lie in store as quantum computing, which you can see scientifically, just like you could see with the COVID virus, is going to be coming, but what will its impacts be? Uh, that's uh, well worth talking about, and it's, and it's intertwining uh, with human behavior. So Ar Arthur and Alex, as I see it, are trying to prevent us from being so surprised, or at least totally surprised, uh, yet again, although in my view, if we do get a, a meaningful quantum attack from a hostile 
state source, let's say, or uh, any malicious source, there will be some things about it which, we will, which will be surprising, no matter how much we work at it in advance. But we could at least reduce the surprise and set up ways to try uh, to be less, uh, less damaged. Now, I, when Arthur said he went around and talked to Treasury officials about this problem uh, of quantum computing. And I, at the time, was one of those Treasury officials. And, uh, and based on that conversation, the, uh, the Office of Financial Research has to put out every year a systemic risk report uh, to the US government saying, well, what are the systemic risks for, uh, for the, um, the American financial system to worry about? Uh, after Arthur talked to me, I put into, got put into the 2020. In 2020, we were worried about a lot of other things, as Arthur said. But in the 2020 Office of Financial Report is this issue of quantum computing as a systemic risk. Uh, early 2021, with the change of administrations, I resigned. But in 2021, quantum computing was still in the systemic risk report of the Office of Financial Research. However, in 2022, it did not appear. It had disappeared. Really? <laughs> there was a long discussion of, of cyber security, but nothing about, uh, about quantum computing as a systemic risk. So one of our objectives should be to get that back in and to the attention in particular, as I'll mention again in a minute, of the Financial Stability Oversight Council known to those of us in the financial trade as FSOC, uh, which is, in, in case you don't know, the, the top committee. It's the head of every major financial organization in the, U, in the US government. And they meet, and they're supposed to be thinking about <laughs> major risks, systemic kinds of risks, and what could be done about it. That goes from the Secretary of the Treasury, head of the Fed, all the, all the heads of the banking agencies, the SEC, and so on. Well, that group ought to have on its agenda someplace, in addition to the national defense operations and the infrastructure operations, uh, operations and homeland security, uh, and, and in addition to all the worry about what we now call conventional uh, uh, hacking attacks, they ought to have this uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, ought to have this quantum computer systemic risk. Now, I tried to think of historic uh, parallels out of my experience. <laughs> I should say my, the first financial crisis that I lived through in the banking business was in 1970. It was the collapse of the Penn Central Railroad, which resulted in the collapse of the commercial paper market and the freezing up of the financial system. It was bailed out by the Fed, of course, but I've seen a lot of those since. One of them was the Herstadt bank collapse in 1974. I think this one is actually an interesting case hmm. for quantum because what happened was when Herstadt, Herstadt was a big trader in, in, the, in the US dollar versus Deutsche Mark for an exchange business, massive volumes. They failed and were closed down at the end of a day in Germany. Happened to be the middle of a day in New York. If you're trading foreign exchange, half the transactions settled in Deutsche Marks in Germany in the daytime there, and the other half settled six hours later in New York in dollars. The failure took place in the middle. And suddenly, everybody said, well, we thought these were simultaneous. Yeah. But they found out half of the transaction had been paid, the mark side. Half of the transaction wasn't paid. And didn't, people didn't know if it could be paid. The German bank had been closed down. And what happened? Clearing stopped in New York. Clearing stopped. They stopped because nobody knew who was broke and who wasn't. And this is one of the fundamental factors in all financial crises, is nobody knows who's broke and who isn't. You may not even know if your own bank or your own investment bank is broke or not, because you don't have the numbers. 
Now, it strikes me this is exactly the sort of thing that would happen mm -hmm. if you had a successful quantum computing-based attack on the Fed's clearing system or on settlement systems or on all the intertwined networks of clearing houses and settlement. You don't know how much money you have. You don't know whether you're broke. You don't know whether anybody else is broke. And so, as is discussed in the report, what happens is individuals protect themselves. And the way it happened in Herstadt was, and I, we did it in our own bank, we said, well, this is easy. Nobody knows if you can get the money, so don't make any payments until you got receipt. So when you receive the funds, you'll be glad to make payment. Well, if everybody says, I can't pay until I receive, then there are no payments. And then the system stops. That's what happened. Well, that already happened in 1974 in a huh. pre- quantum computing world, I think something like that is what is, is to, be, uh, to be feared. Now, I thought of one other one, which I'll just mention, uh, of a historical example, which was the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. In this fire, all the banks in Chicago burned down, and all their ledgers burned up. So they had no idea what, what their balance sheet looked like, or how much they owed their customers or how much their customers, customers owed them. them. Well, that's another interesting one, I think, to think about, depending on the nature of, of the attack. Well, could the cost of all this, we have some really interesting uh, estimates of costs in all this. I, I, I don't know. I, the work is fascinating, I think. But I think we can very plausibly say the costs would be extremely large, would be immense, and in fact, my belief, it's having studied a lot of financial crises, is it's always worse than you think. So even, <laughs> even what we got here, it'll probably be a really big, systemically successful, hostile or malicious attack on clearing systems, I guess, would be even worse. We just don't know what ways, but it's certainly, uh, certainly serious. Uh, the, the list of uh, defensive uh, uh, matters, which you all are very familiar with and, and creating some of, certainly makes sense. There are additional organizational things. What do you have to have in any crisis plan? Well, your systems aren't working. You've got to have special committees who waive the rules, who indemnify people against acting uh, mm -hmm. when acting is risky. Now, that's how you get out of, of the frozen nature uh, of the market. All of that needs to be worked out. And that's why the, uh, the change that I would make to the list of to-dos in this paper is that in addition to making the Federal Reserve think about this, which they certainly should, I'd like to get this on the agenda of FSOC, of the Financial Stability Oversight Council, domestically and of the international corresponding bodies, uh, to think about the, the, the plans and the, uh, and the uh, defensive measures we won't go into offensive measures, not my, <laughs> not my brief, but they would come too, presumably, uh, involved in the, in the risk of quantum computing systemic attacks on the financial system. Well, many thanks, Arthur oh, and thank Alex, you, Alex. Appreciate that. for making us think about this systemic problem uh, and uh, all these issues posed by the sure, surely coming uh, quantum uh, computing uh, revolutions and innovations. Thank you, Alex. <clears throat> you know, you raised, I think, two points which for those of us who are, operate outside of your realm, outside of the financial markets, you can really see these issues boiling down to two, can't you? I mean, one is, <clears throat> the, like like any kind of financial disaster, right? We we anticipate that this will have, will be of, of enormous catastrophic proportions. But nonetheless, it will belong to that family of big financial disasters, crises, etc. Yeah. Um, that that on the one hand, these breed enorm that, that what exacerbates these is uncertainty, right? The way in which it breeds. We don't know who owes us and we don't know who who we owe in that situation. And a quantum computer attack will certainly, certainly be able to feed feed that element of uncertainty and the paralysis that goes with it. <clears throat> the second one is the way in which it undermines trust in the data and information that would continue to flow within the system. 
is the are these transact uh, who do I who is at the other end <laughs> of the transaction I'm engaged in is it is it the other bank that I'm working with is it JP Morgan is it Citibank or is it some hacker who's uh, who's who's playing with the system here and as you point out from the very beginning and it's worth remembering is is that Everything is now electronic within the financial system. There is no substitute. There aren't piles of paper receipts and, and ledgers that are being kept as in reserve for when the systems break down or when they collapse. And so when trust is undermined in the system, in the electronic system, that means trust is undermined uh, in a protracted way to the system as a whole. And in that sense, you could even foresee, we did not mention this as one of our scenarios, in which a malicious attacker says, we're in the system, right? We've managed to do it. We've found a way in which to hack into the system using our quantum computer uh, technology over here. So we've got it now. How would you know? How would you know the, the, the degree to which that the hesitation and again the uncertainty <laughs> and the lack of trust could be spurred by simply the rumor of such an attack is one of the things that is also another dimension to the kind of threat that we're talking about. And here's where the issue of protections comes in. Because if someone were to approach the Federal Reserve, Citibank, JP Morgan and say, we've got a quantum computer, we've done it whether for ransomware or for whatever kinds of other reasons and so on, and you and the bank, uh, the, uh, it, the CISO, CISO office is able to respond and say, no, actually, we've installed quantum safe protections here, uh, and therefore we know that the, the likelihood of such an attack is, uh, is, is virtually nil under these circumstances. We can continue the day continue the day in transactions as before. So it's coming to the question of solutions. It's coming to those questions that we turn to our last panelist, to John Prisco, <laughs> who's been waiting for his chance to talk on <laughs> these kinds of issues. John is, as I say, a friend and colleague. He goes back to the early days of the Quantum Alliance Initiative, giving us his wise counsel and advice and support through it all. And in fact, during his 30 year career, John has demonstrated success driving revenue growth, implementing operational excellence, and bringing companies such as Triumphant, which is one of the companies, cybersecurity companies that you were headed up before that, um, but as well as uh, Quantum Exchange, which you headed up as well, working on uh, post, uh, working on quantum uh, communications technology, which is one of the fundamental building blocks for, for quantum cryptography and quantum safe networks. Uh, but then also the company you head today, which is which is Safe Quantum, uh, and the work that you do internationally, as well as nationally on issues relating to quantum security, quantum science, cybersecurity, and all of the overlapping areas and directions that go with it. And John, I'm I'm very pleased to have you here because I thought there was anyone who could sum up for our audience and for the expertise that we have assembled in the room today, sort of what the implications of this report are for understanding the future of quantum security and of post-quantum as well as quantum cryptography, you'd be the guy I'd want to call on. So I'm calling on you now. Very good. Well, thank you. And thank you for including me uh, in today's uh, event. Um, about three years ago, I was invited to give a TED Talk and the TED Talk subject was quantum, the quantum information and technology world. And if you know about TED Talks, you have 10 minutes to give them. So I'm going to try to do that <laughs> here again. Um, but one of the words that you use that I think is a key word to describe where we are is we're in a very uncertain place. So, you know, my expertise uh, is really in quantum networks and quantum communications. This subject is so big. I mean, we have experts here that from quantum computing, uh, quantum sensing, and I, I really won't touch on that in this discussion because, you know, while quantum computers are looked as, upon as a potential dangerous tool, they're, 
far more important as a very positive good thing that will uh, change the world in the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, but I'll, I'll talk about quantum communications and uh, a little bit about cybersecurity. So um, I ran Triumphant for 11 years. Um, we, we had a very interesting discovery. This was we, not a quantum. No, this, this, before, this was pre, a pre-quantum era. Pre-quantum, this was cybersecurity. But we, we had a very interesting discovery at the New York Times when we discovered that China had hacked into their computers. Uh, and, and what that whole experience <laughs> taught me was that in order to really uh, have a, a good defense, it needed depth. So you, you needed more than one technology. You, know, you couldn't just have antivirus. You, you, know, you needed anomaly <laughs> detection. You needed all sorts of things, and you wanted things that didn't fail the same way. So I look at what we're doing today in quantum communications the same way, that we, we really need to have approaches that have orthogonal failure mechanisms. Uh, they can't be all PQC or post-quantum cryptography. They can't be all QKD. They can't be all uh, entanglement-based, entanglement swapping. It's, it's a combination of those things that will be successful. And when I talk about uncertainty, just look at where we are today with post-quantum cryptography. So NIST has done a wonderful job in getting 82 submissions back in 2016 and whittling them down to a couple. But they've had some bumps along the way that are frightening. You know, they, they've had uh, two of the finalists, well, really one finalist and one almost finalist, uh, fail at, you know, like five or six years into the process. Uh, one was called Rainbow and the other was called Psych. Uh, that created interesting slideware in uh, <laughs> conferences that I attended, like one at NYU recently, where Cisco puts up you know, we're a little nervous about PQC because they named these, these two events and they were hacked with a laptop computer. You know, nothing, nothing close to a powerful quantum computer or any powerful computer. And this was Cisco, who's a major yeah, cybersecurity. Right, so Cisco comes out in this, in this conference and says, we're thinking about using packet switching. Gee, that was great. That was really good for the first internet. Well. What we're thinking of is how about having the packet switch header that we use with our routers, but the actual data is quantum. And it's like, wow, you know, for Cisco to come out publicly and say that, they're worrying about the same things I'm worrying about. One, one thing that Arthur didn't mention about uh, what takes my time up, um, I'm one of the six uh, technical advisory committee chairmen for QEDC, and my TAC, technical advisory committee, is uh, in the area of use cases. So, you know, we just to interrupt. Mm -hmm. I, I did not. I did leave that up. Uh, QEDC is the Quantum Economic Development Consor uh, consortium. consortium, and it is actually created as part of the Quantum Initiative Act. So it was it was deemed to be necessary and created um, at that time. Uh, in any event, my group decided that it wanted to look into uh, an area that's related to quantum key distribution, which is a hardware version of security, and came under quite a bit of criticism around the world from NSA uh, from whatever the NSA equivalent is in the UK. So HC is in there somewhere in their, uh, in their acronym. Um, and the NSA comment was five issues that they were concerned about. The first one was authentication of the hardware. You know, he said, you know, QKD doesn't have an authentication mechanism. Well, they were right. So my TAC said about finding a way to authenticate that NSA would like. And we enlisted their help, and they were collegial, and we had a great discussion together um, about how we would do this. 
So uh, we said, well, you look like you're about to uh, anoint the Crystals group as the standard. So why don't we take Crystals Kyber and, and Crystals Dilithium and come up with a way to use that to authenticate QKD hardware? Would that make you happy? Well, now these were, I'm sorry to interrupt again, just for, mm -hmm. for those who sure. are, for our, for our lay watchers. For Alex. On this, and and for, for Alex as well. <laughs> these are, with the, the Crystals and Crystals Kyber are, are, the, are among the finalists for the NIST. They, they are the, the two, NIST, yeah. they are two of the finalists, yes. Right, in, in the NIST <laughs> yeah. post-quantum cryptography standard Right, process. so so we thought it was a good idea to use what they've selected to fix this legitimate problem that QKD had. And we're doing that now. You know, we, we are going to invite all the QKD manufacturers to try implementing it. And we're writing a paper on this. So, um, you know, that will potentially quiet things down a little bit. But we have this um, really um, bifurcated approach in the federal government about how we view uh, quantum security and quantum networking. We have the Department of Defense, led by the NSA, concerned about what QKD might not be able to guard against. Don't forget, QKD was invented in 1984 by Bennett and Broussard. Bennett was an IBM guy. Broussard was a professor uh, in, I, I can't remember, Canada or somewhere. Um, so this was invented a long time ago. And it's been used a lot. It's been used by me a lot. I built a system in New York City that went from 60 Hudson Street, which is the world's largest uh, telephone switching center. It's where Western Union was founded. And it crossed one of the worst places on earth, the Holland Tunnel, with fiber, and went into Secaucus, New Jersey, where the data centers are. And we transmitted QKD but these are single photon devices, and they're not as sensitive as entangled photon devices that, you know, heat and vibration and all sorts of things uh, trouble them, and, and, you know, they don't work very well. So now that brings you to another area, and I know this is a lot, but the other area is a more advanced type of telecommunications network, which creates a repeater structure based on photon entanglement. And it's complicated. You have to build a memory. You have to correct for heat and vibration and uh, polarization, drift. But it gives you an idea of where we are in this process. We are in a very unsettled state. We don't have a standard for PQC. <coughs> PQC marketing changed over the six years it's been developed, and now they, they market it as quantum resistant, not quantum proof. QKD uh, hasn't had a knock against it since 2014. If you look at the document that, uh, that listed what was wrong with QKD, all the references go back to 2001, most recent reference is 2014. Um, I just started deploying this in 2016. So I have a lot of experience with uh, ID Quantique's <laughs> hardware, with Toshiba's hardware, and this equipment is good and is secure, but it's part of the solution. And we're, we're not quite doing that in this country. China, well in advance of us with QKD networks. Europe, also well in advance of us. If the UK's version of the NSA said they didn't like QKD, well, British Telecom didn't read that memo because they're developing now a system with Toshiba all throughout London to secure their communications with, with QKD. But, you know, I, I think we have a very interesting future ahead of us. Uh, there are companies like QNEC and the Brooklyn Navy Yard that I'm affiliated with that are building quantum memory. They're building all the components necessary to have an entangled photon uh, transmission network. And why is entangled <laughs> photon transmission network important? 
because it is instantly, you're instantly aware if someone is trying to hack into that system. You know, uh, you can't clone a photon, you can't observe it without destroying its quantum state. Uh, so this is where the future of this is going. And, you know, when people try to guess when will quantum computers be fault tolerant and big and, you know, you can look at all the uh, road maps that IBM publishes and others. Uh, I think that you'll see quantum computers doing important things before we have entangled photon telecom networks. You know, that it is a rough road to hoe in order to build quantum memory where you're literally plucking single photons out of a vapor cell and their bits, qubits, their memory. So I don't know if I've scared you or, or <laughs> illuminated some of uh, what's going on, but I guess the most important thing is we have to have a cooperative effort, a cooperative effort in the United States, much more than we've had. And we really, uh, we really need to work with the other agencies like Department of Energy who are very hardware uh, friendly. They're very interested in QKD. The, of course, the electric power grid, we just had a nice <coughs> demonstration in Chattanooga, Tennessee by Cubitech. Uh, so, and, and they've demonstrated the idea of protecting the, uh, the grid with entangled photons. So I, I think when you look at the United States as a whole, we have to think more in terms of partnering technologies, having uh, the ability to uh, have a defense in depth so that there isn't one failure mechanism. Imagine if China already figured out how to break Crystal's Kyber. That would be a disaster. But would they tell us? I don't think so. <laughs> so, 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 you know, in, in order to not put all your eggs in one basket, it would be very wise to uh, combine these technologies and get the best of all of them. And that's what I think the, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve should do. Uh, you, you could, the QKD hardware is available today. It works. And I've tried two main suppliers of that hardware and they both work very well. So why not do something? You know, we have another thing we talk about called harvest now, decrypt later, meaning you can just continually, you know, eat this data. And even though it's encrypted later, when you have a quantum computer, you could factor it and, and be able to see it. What do you think is happening in the 10 years it's gonna take for companies to transition between what they do now, which is RSA, um, you know, public key cryptography, and quantum cryptography? I, I, I really am worried about 10 or 12, and it's gonna take 10 or 12 years. It did in the 70s when we went, you know, Whit, Whit Diffie came up with the great idea and won the Turing Award for it, deservedly, but it took 12 years to do that transition. And we have a much more complicated problem now. You know, when the government says, well, you should have this ready by 2035, that, that's not an unreasonable uh, projection. <laughs> it's gonna take that amount of time for companies to totally transition, yeah. so. Anyway, it's good to be here and uh, enjoyed hearing all the speakers. Well, thank you, John. Um, and thanks for giving us a kind of a, a, a tour d'horizon of where uh, quantum security measures lie. On the one hand, or on the software side, which is what the post-quantum cryptography approach is, the one that NIST has been working on since 2016. And of which NIST is by no means the only, the only standards that are out there. There are other companies that have been working on software-based um, uh, quantum-resistant and, quant and uh, quantum-resistant algorithms uh, for a long time. Or on the other hand, the hardware-based systems uh, which rely on uh, 
quantum key distribution, quantum random number generators, uh, or entanglement-based yeah. uh, types of solutions that go with it uh, as well. Um, should we open it up to some questions for about 10 minutes and I'll have some con sure. concluding words. So, questions from the audience? Well, if you do have a question and want to pose one, just do me a favor. Just be sure to um, uh, speak into the microphone, which will be coming around in order for uh, that, uh, for, for you to be able to hear the question. And the other one is just identify yourself and whatever affiliation you care to, you care to mention as part of your, so part I of your introduction. Question, but I do actually what uh, John, John just So here's, here's our mic. So, hi. So I'm Sunil Gupta. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Q Labs uh, from India. Oh. Uh, so we have been uh, doing a similar things in, 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 in India there. Uh, and as you would know that India has done a national quantum mission announced and relaunched it uh, a month ago. And uh, India is open to QKD as well as post-quantum cryptography, right? So right now we have taken that approach. Um, what we are seeing, right, uh, what is working and what is a probably a, a, a more acceptable model for adoption of quantum cryptography is all the dedicated private networks, right, defense, uh, critical infrastructure, QKD hardware is, is important, zero tolerance, so you go and use QKDs. Uh, we have actually built uh, QKD, 150 kilometer point to point. We have trusted nodes. Uh, we have built a hub and spoke. Now hub and spoke, now we are, uh, we just got an order, we're deploying that very large network. Uh, in this in is the essential infrastructure. Infrastructure, for, right? For, so for people are open to that because they know that that is the best way, single photon uh, based uh, uh, QKD that we have. And uh, idea is here with a trusted node, of course, till the memory comes, we, we can extend networks, we can make bigger networks. We are now building almost about 1,000 kilometer, uh, kilometers uh, network, right? Uh, but as you get into uh, shared networks, public networks, intranet, internet, um, blockchains, that is where the combination of quantum random number generator with post-quantum cryptography, right? Uh, algorithms bring the real value, right? You can, you can build a VPN solutions, you can build a vault solutions, a number of uh, interesting data for data in transit and data test security solution can be built. Right. So, um, so I agree with you. I mean, QKD is important. <laughs> we are seeing that, that uh, all these authentication issues and all this can be addressable, right? People had issues about side channel attacks. Those have been addressed. People have built tamper-proof boxes now, uh, right? Uh, this thing. I think the only challenge that we have seen it's a testing and certification, mm -hmm. right? That continues to be a problem, right? There's no still I'm sorry, st it, certification and standard. Oh, yeah, certification right. and testing continues to be a problem. Constant. India went ahead and actually did a standard, built their own standards. Of course, not their own standard in the sense I was part of the working group for the National Quantum Mission, where what we helped India come up an acceptable standard, right? Using HC and standards and ISO standards mm -hmm. and, and uh, other uh, standards. ITOT standards, and we have come up with a, a very beautiful um, standardization document where we said, what are the different standards we will, as, again, this is a, we call it a, I would say, 1.0 <laughs> uh, deployment. But I think the important part, what is there, with my experience is that we need to jump into it, right? Otherwise, too late, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Well, well, we, we, can, late. we can always correct it, right? We can always go and replace with quantum memories when it comes, we can all do that. But if you're not making that jump, we won't even know what works and what doesn't work. Right? Well, and Etsy just released a, a, an image of a QKD standard, yeah. which is something someday NIST would do. You know, when, when we used to get uh, FIPS certification yeah. here in the United States, you always had a NIST standard, and then you hire a NIAP laboratory to do the testing. Right. Well, we can't do that with QKD because yeah. there is no QKD standard that NIST has come up with. Yeah. They're busy. They're working on PQC. So, so, so that's the reason I'm saying it. QKD works very well. Your own dedicated limited network it terminates. You don't have to interface with somebody else. Right. But because we at say 014 has come up, you can interface that with Cisco and Juniper and other uh, Palo Alto and so on. So you have at least a standard interface to share your keys, right? Mm -hmm. At right. least as long as that is there, you're fine. Yes. <laughs> that's a minimal standard that you need, right? So I think that is working well. 
Now, in terms of the moment you get into other financial, uh, interesting healthcare and so on, as I said, random number generator. I think what I what we are found that the biggest and easiest thing to sell and people resonate with with the customers is lack of entropy. Right? People understand that well concept, mm -hmm. right? And they're fairly good. So if you bring come in with quantum random number generator, we have that product that we offer as an entropy as a service on AWS marketplace as well. Mm -hmm. So once you go and talk talk to that, and that is a good wedge <laughs> into into a thing because I think everybody is worried about it, honestly. And uh, what initially, you know, it, we have been evangelizing it now almost about four years, right? First three years we just evangelized, no business, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? But I think, uh, but that really led to this uh, my sharing my experience there, and we felt that after COVID, during COVID when people started becoming a little serious because at least in India, we were under attack, threat, right? Our IPs were under attack, threat. Um, um, our India was not prepared for COVID, but you know, in India, everybody went to digital, right? Cloud and so on. We were not prepared. So there were so many vulnerabilities and so on. So it was easy. We were sitting duck <laughs> for, for hackers to do that. They brought a seriousness, right, in terms of let's go and look at technology to protect ourselves, right? Yep. That's an interesting so, point. Right, so, so that, uh, we saw that very clearly, that impetus that came into the Indian government to really say, hey, hi, how are we going to, uh, to deploy? So, and uh, today, um, uh, uh, even data centers, data centers are being protected. Another interesting use case, what we saw from the banking uh, organizations, everybody is worried about golden copy of their data. Right, if somebody hacks ransomware or something like that, mm -hmm. right, ransomware is the biggest problem. Everybody wants to go back to a golden copy they can trust, right? And we said, hey, we can help you get a golden copy of the data, <laughs> right? Where it is copied, it is backed up, uh, cleaned up, and and you can always go back and on a on an optical fiber or on a on a on a, on a wireless network we can provide you a nearby data center, near data center. So, um, so, so, so we are seeing very interesting time. I think we are seeing some uh, acceptance of QKD as well as other technologies there. I think the key challenge to what we still see is the three key, key challenges that we are seeing. And I'm, my question now comes up is uh, any input that you have on that. Number one is uh, always there's a constant question about how good the QRNGs are against so pseudo random numbers, give them the proof. The only NIST uh, sweet test is not enough. So I want to understand from other colleagues here, uh, friends, that uh, what are the ways that you're looking But I see these th three deterrents, right? It takes a lot of time for people to convince how good the quantum is. And second is that uh, certification, right? Uh, what, is, uh, what is the thoughts in US uh, and what, what, what are the, uh, I think you did some work in standardization, right, in, in, in early on. Mm -hmm. So how do we go and test uh, these QKD and QRNGs? What are the right uh, stuff? So that is uh, important. And the third question is around um, uh, that uh, this, this, when you deploy this, uh, this whole uh, hardware and so on, how are you seeing the, um, the upgrade, how, what is the, how the system is going to be replaced and upgrade and so on, the whole, whole life cycle? Right, so I don't know whether uh, you, because you had done a lot of the boxes during quantum exchange also. <laughs> so, so these were the my, my questions. Well, um, you know, essentially, you're correct when you have a uh, dark fiber direct connection. Uh, it's a very secure deployment, and we've done primarily telecommunications companies, Verizon here in the Washington DC area for their 5G networks. We've connected those nodes uh, on dark fiber. Um, you know, we, we've done banking at JP Morgan Chase uh, in New York uh, regarding the blockchain work that they wanted us to take a look at. Again, dark fiber, you know, uh, a, a simple point-to-point -point network. So, you know, it's, it's very tamper evident if somebody tries to tamper with a QKD network that's configured that way. <coughs> and, um, you know, companies that are 
really making an investment in quantum science are primarily financial companies today uh, outside of the government. Um, I've done work at Morgan Stanley, uh, at JP Morgan, as I mentioned, and uh, Wells Fargo. And they've hired people. Goldman Sachs has done that too. Uh, JP Morgan went out and got one of the rock stars of quantum from IBM, a guy named Marco Pistoia. And he has a group that uh, is dedicated to this. So, so are they, <laughs> you ask me, are they prepared? Well, they may not be prepared, but they're preparing. And, you know, the same thing happened to Did us. Well, we, we had a system that they deployed, but it was on fiber that we worked with them to, to get. Who has the Federal Reserve hired? Similarly, we we, we, <laughs> we we haven't done anything at the Federal Reserve, but but I sure know that we could. <laughs> yes, it could. Well, that's what's so interesting about this too, John, is that you've got these signs of uh, fluttering of quantum life in different banks and in different sectors, and yeah. and proof of concepts and so on. But what's what's needed are uh, first of all a kind of larger. Uh, regulatory in, o oversight with regard to this. I and mean, here's, I think, where the Federal Reserve comes in. And then also Sunil, our guest Sunil, also brought up the issue about standards and, and certification. Uh, and you know, um, a number of years ago, two, two three years ago, um, in this very, on the, in this very, not this very room, but just down the hall at the conference center there, um, we worked with the Quantum Alliance Initiative, pulled together the consortium of companies and yeah. labs to work on standards for QKD and QRNG. Uh, some of our guests here in the room, Charles Harvey uh, was here, was part of that process. Also our guest from, from Poland, University of Warsaw, Magda Stobinska was also part of that process. Um, our friends from uh, IDQ were, were, were helped to lead the team on that de development. And when the standards were finished and we submitted them to the International Telecommunications Union, which went through without objections, which is their interesting way of passing, of passing standards for both of those. We then attempted to get the federal government interested in adopting those standards for QKD and for QRNG. In other words, to initiate, to hear the standards that we've got, we've developed, let's initiate now the process that leads through, through FIPS. Through, through NIAP and so on for certification and testing and evaluation right. with it. The challenge we face in the United States, the challenge is if it's not invented here, it doesn't exist. Um, and that is a, that's a problem. And so if you don't have NIST engaged in developing those standards, then those standards do not appear on anyone's, <coughs> anyone's radar screen or on their to-do list in any kind of way. And uh, that's a challenge, and that's yes. going to be a problem if the federal government or key agencies have turned their back on a technology like QKD. It's going to make it all the more difficult to adopt uh, standards that work elsewhere in the world, but which in the United States are blocked from that. You're discussing that a human behavior problem, not a technical problem. <laughs> which, uh, unfortunately, they tend to, to get, <laughs> if, I may, if I may use the term entangled. Yes. <laughs> tend to get entangled. Do we have another question? Uh, please. Hi. Uh, Aluri Srinivas. I'm the co-promoter of uh, QNU, along with Sunil. Uh, my question was more on the political side of it. One of the difficult things we, sitting in India especially, look at quantum and quantum encryption is really the black box called China. Okay, so our feeling, I mean, the more we talk to them, I used to be with Morgan Stanley on the private equity side. and um, So we have at least seven companies that I know of which are commercially viable quantum QKD companies. Okay, These are state-owned, three of them, four of them are private. Uh, we know some of the information that they kind of sketchily give out in different forms because they don't, it's, it's pretty opaque. But just glancing at you would know that they're probably a couple of years ahead of the rest of the world. Okay, that's a scary part. Just in terms of whether it's a distance, whether it's the way you do it, whether you kind of, you know, uh, uh, a satellite QKD or any of those, our feeling is that at least a couple of years ahead. So what's, what's kind of thinking in the U.S. or what's, like, you know, how do you look at something like that? Because see, 
Look, we had the COVID, and one of the difficulties is the opaqueness. And you can't just sit there and wait for it to blow up and then say, look, I wish we could do something earlier. So I, I just want to look, because, you know, just, just the panel to kind of, you know, throw some light on what they think here. Well, yeah, I guess. What's your evaluation on that? I mean, we, I think everyone, is, everyone has said repeatedly, including me in my Forbes columns, China is ahead, particularly with regard to quantum communication, which is the bedrock of quantum cryptography. They're the ones who launched the first quantum satellite, the Misha satellite, back in 2016. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who have a second quantum satellite uh, to engage in quantum communications from, from space. Um, from where your evaluation in terms of comparative analysis, what, where do you take on this, John? Well, I think that um, they were brave to deploy so much of this technology early. And I think they're showing the world that it can be secured. You know, the, the concept of a trusted node is really looked down upon in the United States because at a trusted node, you expose uh, your data to plain text for an inch of cable it, within, yeah. within, a, within a rack, okay? Now, I mentioned before uh, 60 Hudson Street. I, I can't imagine how anybody would get into 60 Hudson Street. I, I had equipment there and a lease and I couldn't get in. I, they would, <laughs> I'm telling you, no, they would they would really look you over and before they let you into your own space. Uh, so you know, I think that China, China has taken a position that I think entrepreneurs would take, and that is, this stuff works. It works well. It works better than anything else that we're aware of. We're going to do it. And that's what they did. They deployed you know, tens of thousands of kilometers <laughs> of fiber. And they're connecting cities uh, over great distances with their satellite. Um, so yeah, they're ahead of us. And, um, and Europe's ahead of us. And th this is such an international um, series of discoveries. You know, the Netherlands is ahead of all of us in terms of entangled communications networks. It's just because they're focused on it, and we are not. You know, we, we have Department of Energy focus because of the... When the, you say we, are you talking about the government of the United States? Or yeah. Are you talking about talking the about, United States society? Talking about society. The, the government, the government of, of, yeah. of the United States. I, you know, I think the financial community is quite focused on it. Um, because they're the people that we work with. Uh, but well, they're interested in protecting their customers. Right. But you know, there is a, a big BAA that just came out from DARPA last week down here in, in Virginia. Uh, and they're talking about, you know, having a quantum network interface card built by someone. Now what would that look like? <laughs> you know, would it be entangled or would it just be single photons. Who knows? I mean, it's a very uh, big project that's going to take over 50 months to do in three phases. And I'm only telling you what, what's publicly available. And I don't know anything that isn't publicly available. So I can't leak something. Uh, <laughs> no, but, you know, it's DARPA. So they, they're very, very careful. Um, but, but in any event, they're trying to do something now that, that's very interesting because DARPA is part of the Department of Defense and NSA is part of the Department of Defense. So maybe we're seeing a little crack in that armor. Are you seeing a little bit of movement there with regard to it depends. kind of the, the hardline position with regard to QKD as being inferior <laughs> in every respect to QKC? Well, the, the, the ice is starting to break a bit on that one. I don't know. The, the, the document that we were given to study before the meeting was about, I don't know, 30 pages or so. And on page four, I stopped reading when it said, anybody who wants to propose QKD is strongly discouraged. Wow. <laughs> I thought, 
that's really wow. something. Wow, I, I need really, not apply. It's hard to read UKD past scientists that. scientists need but, not apply. But anyway. You know what, we've got time for one more question, and then I'm going to have a, try to have to wrap it up. Yeah, Fra Francis, did you want to yeah, take it? Yes, I would love to ask a question. Uh, my name is Francis Barudo. I come from Montreal. I'm the CEO and president of a quantum e-motion. The motion means because uh, uh, our technology is based on the motion of electrons. We don't use the photons. We're trying to do exactly the same as uh, using electrons, another quantum particle. So my, my question is actually, it's more of a comment. Don't you think that one of the difficulties that we have here to, to be the sort of a prophet for the threat you know, of quantum computers is that in, in many ways, it's still um, you know, an apathetic threat, of course. And is, I still remember always that, you know, what, what happened, remember the turn of the, the century when we, the, the threat of computers and everything. And people often talk to me about it. Well, yes, they're trying to use these, you know, imaginative, you know, I mean, uh, imaginary threats like to, to sell stuff and, uh, and nothing happened, you know, right. at the end, right. you know, and a lot of people got rich, you know, about it, you know, right. by spreading uh, threats, you know. So that's an interesting, actually, you know, that's, that comes back to what the comment you made about human behavior. My question really is, you know, uh, you, you, you focus a lot on, on actually on um, uh, quantum key distribution where are purely quantum technologies. But in fact, there is very, you know, very little comments, you know, they've done like my colleague here about QRNGs, okay? Because if I understand, I'm, I'm not a, a physicist, neither an engineer, I'm more of a business guy in this context here. What I understand that the usage of QRNGs today already could improve the encryption and the, the potential issues that we have encryption. Cybersecurity is not a tomorrow problem. It's a big, big issue already today. You know, we, I mean, we know that uh, quantum computers are going to add another huge potential layer, uh, layer. I believe that's the big threat. Yes, of course, you know. But why don't we focus already into improving here our, you know, cybersecurity uh, and uh, using actually a quantum, you know, technology like, because, and on top of that, if you associate QRNGs with entropy as a service plus post uh, quantum encryption, you have a system that, again, I'm not a specialist, but can easily compete at, with the quantum key distribution at a very, very lower cost. Mm -hmm. Yep. So this is well, my comments I wanted to take. Yeah, no, I, mean, I, I think right. right. I mean, Q, QRNG, quantum random yeah. number generators, are yeah, yes. an essential yes. tool and now and in the future, right. including for QRNGs. But you don't, you don't need a quantum key distribution. You can do a lot of things just with the QRNGs, entropy as a service, post-quantum you know, post mm -hmm. encryption. Well, there are a number of companies now that are, uh, that are serving up entropy. Yeah. Yeah. I can answer this like, yeah, yeah, but, but, but yeah. I'd like to hear you. But, but the thing that really uh, causes us to watch out for what we can do today is the harvest now, decrypt later problem. You know, um, countries, many countries, go to the ends of uh, submarine cables because they're easy to get to when they're landing, you know, like in the South China Sea where you've got... 23 nations all claiming to own some part of 64 cables. It's very confusing, right? And anybody can be working on them, and it's hard to know if they're legitimately working on them. Well, what they're doing, and lots of countries are doing this, I'm not singling anyone out, is they're just swallowing all that data every day. And, you know, we're talking about more than a decade of that ahead of us. So yes, we, we need to do whatever we can to prevent that from happening. And, and I do think, you know, every QKD system has a QRNG built in it. And you can have, you can make a truly random QRNG, especially if it's optical. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to do it without QKD, but I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to learn. Um, what we're going to do now is I want to say a couple words. We talked about China. 
and where China is with regard to quantum communications, quantum infrastructure. Of course, one of the key questions, which is very pertinent to our report, is where is China with regard to quantum computing? And how far the development has, has China gone? Now, that could be a great topic for another session. But I would point out one thing when we talk about the timeline to, to large-scale quantum computers, that Chinese scientists, and they're not alone by any means, have begun to look into the possibility of not waiting for a large-scale quantum computer in order to, in order to test um, RSA decryption, for example, at, with more and more complex levels, but integrating, integrating uh, quantum annealing uh, and hybrid systems as a means, as a shortcut to achieving what we had and what the conventional wisdom was, had always imagined as being large scale, big, huge, <laughs> you know, millions of entangled qubits in order to carry out encryption. So the timeline issue is one also to be, that needs to be explored about how much time do we really have and what do we really want. I will say this, um, with regard to our report, finally, uh, I'll just mention the four topics, the four recommendations that we came up with for the report. And I think the coming here at the end and having listened to the expert discussion and the questions as well as the analysis we've got will help put these into some I think into some perspective. The four that we developed as part of this, Alex, was number one, that the Federal Reserve, in order to protect against this kind of, mitigate the risk of this kind of a threat, really needs to look into adopting the NIST standards for post-quantum cryptography. As we learned, those standards are by no means perfect. Those standards are in themselves works in progress. Uh, and it by no means should the Fed or any other financial agency or oversight body overlook the utility of QKD and hardware-based quantum cryptography solutions to order to protect against quantum computer tech. But the NIST standards are there. It's an important <laughs> and immediate step that could be taken in that direction. The second one is for the Federal Reserve Chairman to convene a quantum summit bring together the big banks, those who are already working on quantum technology and those for whom are still, this is still unknown terrain, to talk about and to raise awareness about the quantum threat. Number three is for Congress. We recommend in the report to set a deadline, as Congress and the, Fed, and the White House have already done for federal agencies in the executive branch, a deadline for, uh, the, for, uh, for Federal Reserve banks themselves to adopt quantum safe solutions and to build a timeline, a timeline and a game plan to in order to achieve that result. And then the fourth recommendation that comes from our report is to create a task force within the Federal Reserve, a task force either appointed by the Federal Reserve or, or appointed by Congress <laughs> and the federal government to oversee and to direct those efforts at making the, the Federal Reserve Banks quantum safe and quantum secure, but then also to expand into the other networks upon which the Federal Reserve System and our own financial system uh, are function uh, and take place. And I think I might, after listening to Alex's recommend, add Feds, uh, FESOC uh, to that list of bodies that need to be involved in a quantum summit and to be part of the oversight. Oversight Arthur, now we have five people. political recommendations. Five political recommendations, <laughs> which I think is which I think is 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 the limit for the time <laughs> attention, the attention span of Congress and of federal regulators. I know we've reached the limit of our time attention span for our listeners and for our audience today. I want to thank everyone for coming and to be involved with it. And I also want to thank, as I'm sure we all do, our panelists for this really wonderful and, and engaging and constructive discussion. Thank you.